So today we're going to be discovering more about the discipline that God has in store for us. Just a way of reminder, some of the things that we learned last week. And uh, how many of you uh, were at our uh, uh, our discipleship time last week after church? Show of hands. Yeah, a few of you. Uh, that was a really great time. I really enjoyed it. I went home that day and I told Emma, I said, that was fun um, to hear. And I know we didn't break up into groups like we usually do, but just to hear... Uh, Different people talk about um, the, the, the disciplines that we're reading about in that book by Don Whitney, but then also just the idea of what, what God is doing uh, through the spiritual disciplines. And one of the things we discovered last week in the sermon message, if you were here, was that um, God disciplines us and, and the Christian disciplines that we observe as believers, um, there are two things that are involved in in being a follower of Christ when it comes to discipline, okay? We have to first abandon things, right? That was the first A word that we looked at. We have to abandon, and then we have to what? Adopt, that's right. Some of you are looking in your notes. Abandon and adopt. A relationship with, with God through Christ looks like this. You have to, at the same time, that's why they call repentance an about face. How many military people in here, you know what an about face is? Right? In, in one motion, right, you, you turn completely around, right, without shuffling your feet a whole lot. It's really, it's really cool. But that's kind of the idea with when we come to faith in Christ, and it's, it's an about face. In one motion, we're turning away from our sin and we're turning to the Savior. Okay? And so the dis living a disciplined life is like that. We can't add Jesus to what we're already doing. We can't be heading toward hell and say, I want some Jesus on the side, right? I, I, I want to get involved in, in religion. And there are religious groups, there are lots of churches that will be happy, will be happy to help you in that if you'll just come and sit in their service. If they can get you in their church, in their small group, whatever. They just want to add, they'll help you add Jesus. But when we go to the scripture, the scripture says, you can't just add Jesus to your agenda. It doesn't work that way. And if we're a loving church and we're loving to each other as disciples, we wouldn't let each other live that way either. So there comes a time in your life, especially if you're a parent, is specifically incumbent upon you because you're not just a disciple of Jesus Christ. You as a Christian parent have little people to disciple. And so it's incumbent upon you as a Christian parent, if you're a parent to, or a grandparent, to say no to your kids. To say no. Because that's what being a Christian is about. God is going to tell you no to things. He's going to discipline you because you're now a child of God, right? You're now a child of God. We also learned that the Christian disciplines are different from the disciplines that we find in culture right? They're just, they're, they're different. So when we talk about what our goal is today, our goal, the goal of our discipline that looks different from the world is it, the discipline's different from the world and the goal is different from the world. Our goal in pursuing Christian discipline and the disciplines is the glory of God. It's not a better you in 12 days. It's not a bigger bank account. It's not more influence in the workplace. It's not more favor in the world. It's the glory of God that's completely different than what the world is after. But if you continue as a Christian down that path and you read those self-help books and you watch those people on TV and all that other stuff and you're not in your Bible, if you're not in your Bible... You're going to run that way. You're going to do those things without the counsel of the Lord. And you're going to be duped into thinking Jesus is on board with you when he's not. Okay. That's just to get us started, okay? So we've learned about discipline already. Abandoning and adopting. There's, a, there's an old self and there's a new self. And the Bible tells us in Ephesians, put off the old self. Put on the new self right? Not 
Bring the new self along with the old self. It's all good. We have a part in the process, we learned last week. And God has a part in the process. Paul told Timothy, discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness. What stands out to you in that verse? Tell you what stands out to me, that I'm supposed to do something. Discipline yourself. Discipline yourself. So going back to parenting, my job as a parent for my kids is to teach them how to discipline themselves. How do I do that? I discipline them. So that when they become adults, they are self-disciplined. They have independence. They have responsibility. My job as a parent is not to make everything okay for my kids. It's to teach them how to respond and how to act and how to behave and how to take in life when things don't go your way. Because it will happen, won't it? You'll fail the test. You won't get the job. You'll get fired. Your car will break down. Whatever. Someone will break your heart. What are you going to do? Turn to the Lord. Don't turn to yourself. And so Paul tells Timothy, discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness. That's the end. That's the purpose. But also Hebrews tells us that God is actually also the, the main character in our discipline. He's at work as well. So we have a responsibility and God is sovereignly at work. Hebrews chapter 12 tells us that those whom the Lord loves, he disciplines. And he scourges, the Bible says. You know what that means? He whips. He wounds. The Bible says this about our God. Those whom the Lord loves, he disciplines, and he scourges every son whom he receives. That is, everyone who's adopted into God's family, he will discipline you. It's not a matter of if. It's just a matter of when. And then he says this, it is for discipline that you endure. That is, we should want to endure under the disciplining hand of God so that we would be a disciplined believer for his glory. And then he says, God deals with you as with sons. This is Hebrews 12, 6 through 7. So as we looked at last week, Christians are holy people. Holy people. Don't get hung up on that. It doesn't mean that you're better than other people in and of yourself. It means you've been chosen to be different. But you have been chosen to be different. Why? Because God's grace upon you. He chose you. And that's why we want to be disciplined. We are different. And Christian di discipline is different. Because God wants you and me to be holy. So today, what we're going to discover is we're going to discover more in God's Word concerning discipline. Today's focus, however, is on how all Christian dis discipline, whether initiated by ourselves or by God, is essentially for His glory. As the old Westminster Shorter Catechism says, it asks the question, what is the chief end of mankind? What's man's purpose? And the answer is, the chief end of man is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. To glorify God and enjoy him forever. And those aren't two mutually exclusive things. It just so happens that when we glorify God, we enjoy it. God doesn't say, I, I am going to make you glorify me and you're going to hate it every step of the way. No, sir. No. No. We enjoy it because when we're in that right place when we're bringing him glory and we're in heaven for all eternity, that's what we're doing. We're praising him, giving him glory and it's the greatest sense of enjoyment you could even imagine. Everything else in this world pales in comparison to the enjoyment that we're going to experience when we're in Jesus' presence face to face on that day. John Piper has recently popularized that part of the Westminster Shorter Catechism. What is the chief end and purpose of, all, of, of mankind? Over the last 20 years, Piper's been writing books on what he calls Christian hedonism. Where he kind of takes the, the old writings uh, uh, of Jonathan Edwards. And he says that, that Christians are, are, are to enjoy the Lord, this side of heaven. 
and expect the enjoyment that we're going to experience in heaven. But this idea of this being the chief end, the chief end of man, the telos, the, the driving force, the purpose. Now we know that there is an end to every person. There's an end to everything that every person in embarks upon whether it's your job whether it's the place where you live whether it's your very life there is an end to everything right there's a destination to everywhere that we're going but for the christian specifically for the christian the bible says there should be an intentional movement towards a particular end a particular purpose, and that particular end and purpose is God's glory. God's glory. That's your purpose. Now, the, the, the devil, our enemy, bristles against that. How dare God? How dare he create things out of nothing for his own glory? How selfish that is of God to do that. And we as Christians say, no, he alone is worthy. We sing that all the time, don't we? He alone is worthy. He alone is worthy. Why is he worthy? Because of who he is. Not because of what he did for me yesterday or today or a week ago. Or even what I think he's going to do for me. He's worthy of all of my praise and devotion simply because of who he is. So we as Christians must have an intentional movement towards the glory of God. We should not live our lives haphazardly. We are different. Because of our purpose, because of our end being the glory of God, we cannot go about every day in a haphazard fashion. We need to be disciplined. Our lives should be moving towards the only appropriate end for someone who's been saved by grace through faith alone in Christ alone. The Bible says we were dead in our transgressions he made us alive together with Christ. You were dead. Now you're alive. We should be moving towards God's glory. When I was a kid, I didn't like to read. You know, most people today don't like to read. It's beginning to be more so when you can watch a video or listen to a podcast or whatever. You know, libraries don't even have very many books in them anymore. They're mostly computers and stuff like that. But uh, I read a, a statistic not long ago that like 80%, somewhere around 80% of college graduates never read another book in its entirety after graduation. Isn't that crazy? It's like the upper 70%, it's almost 80%. Never read a complete book after they graduate from college. I'm the total opposite. I never read when I was younger. It was when God forced me to go to Bible college and seminary when he called me to ministry and and I went and I started opening up the Bible and other books and I started reading books and now uh you know I like to read but when I was a kid I hated it and I used to read this book that uh that we had in our house we had several of them it's kind of like a little series called choose your own adventure anybody ever read a choose your own adventure book all right a couple more slackers out there like me all right, so I, I got this book, it's, you know, it's pretty good, you know, it's a thick book, it's like, yeah, I like this. And I found out about it by my brother, because he knew I didn't like to read, he loved to read, he plowed through books all the time. And I found out that Choose Your Own Adventure book is you start reading the book, and you get to a certain place at the end of a chapter, which is about three pages long, and the, and the end of the chapter says, if you want to get on the boat and go to, you know, wherever, turn to page 50. If you would rather, if you would rather not get on the boat and get on the plane to go so-and-so, turn to page 130. I'm like, cha-ching! <laughs> I'm going to page 130. And I would uh, choose, make my choices based upon how far it would get me towards the end of the book. I didn't care about what the storyline was. I just wanted to skip ahead. The Christian life is not like that. You cannot skip the hard parts. You cannot skip through. You cannot skip ahead. God is going to discipline you. You are going to have to discipline yourself along the way. The glory of God is manifested 
in each one of our stories through joy and through pain, through gain and through loss. I mention this a lot because it always comes up when I'm in the scriptures. The dangers of the prosperity gospel. Some people think they know what the prosperity gospel is, but it's very insidious and it creeps in. Even when you least expect it. It's very much like the serpent whispering in in, uh, Eve's ear in Genesis. Sounds really good. And that is that if if you're right with God in the Christian life, you will not experience loss or pain. Because God only intends for his children to have good things this side of heaven. It's not true. We read that passage from Hebrews a while ago. Those children who are his, every son whom he receives, he disciplines. Because of that personal relationship. And because of what we need to happen in our life. Many times, which only comes through trial. Sometimes a very difficult trial. So if someone trying to sell you a gospel of prosperity and the gospel of favor... Don't buy it. That's not our Heavenly Father. The end. Our, our crown, the Bible says, is God's glory. We were watching a video just the other day of the Dallas Mavericks 2011 championship. It was a little mini movie. Sean Marion, some of you might remember him when he played for the Phoenix Suns. He was a player on the Dallas Mavericks at that time and they showed the team afterwards they're in the locker room and they're throwing champagne around and they're interviewing people and they've got on their championship caps. He said, 12 years I've been waiting for this. All for this moment. To hold this trophy. And I thought how interesting it is for players who play in the NBA who've probably won tons of championships in high school and college and they've, they've made it to the Final Four in college or whatever, but they're all wanting to hold that NBA championship trophy. Everything leads up to that. Many players never get to see it. They never get to hold the trophy. The Bible says that our trophy, the one that matters in this world and all of our life is God's glory. That's it. It stands alone. There's nothing else in comparison. In 1 Peter 5, 4, Peter charges the elders of the churches to be ready for the Lord's second return, for the the Lord's return. And he says, "Don't, don't exercise your authority over the church body with, like, under compulsion, excuse me, but do it joyfully. As an elder, do it joyfully. And then he says, because when the chief shepherd comes, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. Now, what does it mean by that? What's the promise to local church leadership? It's not that somebody's going to put a crown on my head or on the head of other pastors. It's that our crown, our end, our goal is the glory of God in Jesus Christ. When Jesus comes again and his church is called up and we're gathered together in his presence, that, that is what the ministry of an elder and a pastor is all about. So he's saying to them, don't grow weary. Don't grow weary. Hebrews 13 Verses 20 through 21. Now the God of peace who brought up from the dead the great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the eternal covenant, Jesus Christ our Lord, equip you in every good thing to do his will. Listen to, the, listen to this. Working in us that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. The prayer for that writer of Hebrews to the church is that they would be equipped in every good thing to do the will of the Father. Every single thing that we do. To do His will, working in us that which is pleasing in His sight. So every step along the way, the goal of our discipline, God's glory, every step along the way, 
As the writer of Ephesians, as Paul says in Ephesians, learning what is pleasing to him. That's what we want. We want to be pleasing to him. So on, on one hand, God is going to discipline us so that he's pleased with us and so that he's glorified in the end. But our goal, our part, is to purposefully, to purposefully try and please the Lord in all that we do. So that sounds a little like works-based salvation. It's not, because we're not saved. We're not saved by our works. We're saved by his grace. But we're saved for good works, that we should walk in them, as the Bible says. So, I want to turn your attention to this, to this one principle. And that is this, that God, in his part, God plays the long game. God plays the long game. So that means that there's, there's no shortcut, there's no quick fix to our being disciplined or to pursuing this spiritual discipline. Some of those spiritual disciplines, prayer, worship, Bible intake, prayer or a fa- a fasting, silence and solitude, meditation, getting alone. Uh, one author, uh, Richard Foster, in his book about the disciplines, talk, he has a, a chapter on simplicity. The discipline of simplicity decluttering your life because we're just go 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 and we have all the tools and we have all the toys and it creates more anxiety than it does ease if you have a smartphone man i'm preaching to the choir right here you got to have a smartphone if you're going to live in today's world okay well what else comes with that social media that you have to check 24 7 Simplicity. These are some of the disciplines that we find throughout the Word of God. These are the things that God intends for us to do and to practice, these habits that were more like Jesus. But God has a part and He plays the long game. In Hebrews chapter 12, you might already be there because we just read from there. We're about to go to the Old Testament. So, Hebrews chapter 12. Verse 10 and 11 compares the discipline we receive by our earthly fathers and the discipline that we receive from God. He says, for they disciplined, talking about earthly fathers, they disciplined us for a short time as seemed best to them. Now, why do we discipline our kids what seems best to us? Because we don't know the future, do we? I don't have a crystal ball. I don't know what my kids are going to experience later on in life. My limitation, right? And so we discipline, we discipline our kids because of what we think seems best because of our knowledge. But here's the thing. God doesn't do that. He doesn't discipline us based on what he thinks seems best. Why? Because he's timeless. It's one of the things that makes him God. He's timeless. He sees everything as an eternal now. It's happening right now. He sees it. He knows it. And so, because of who he is, he doesn't discipline us exactly like we discipline our children. What does it say here? He disciplines us for our good. So, wait, I I discipline my kids for, for good. No, you discipline your kids for what you think is good. He knows exactly what is good for you and for me. And his discipline is fitting to his knowledge. That we may share his holiness. Verse 10 says, All discipline for the moment seems not to be joyful, but sorrowful. Yet, to those who have been trained by it, afterwards it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness. Therefore, strengthen the hands that are weak and the knees that are feeble. God plays the long game. Turn in your Bibles to Jeremiah 29. 11 through 13. Not long ago, we passed a church in Tempe area, Chandler area. It was called 2911 Church. Isn't that what it was called, Emily? 2911 Church. And I remember the first time I saw it, I was like, what? What's that? Is like the address? Like what? And then I figured, oh, it's Jeremiah 2911. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Right? This, this is a verse that we use all the time as an encouragement, right? That the Lord has our back. We're going through tough times. 
Maybe something you have highlighted in your Bible or over your mirror in your bathroom, something like that. Now, did any of you ever have a mom or dad who, who would say something like this before they disciplined you? Especially if they were going to give you a spanking. This is going to hurt you more than it hurts me. Did, did it, this is going to hurt you. This is going to hurt me more than it hurts you. <laughs> now I'm a parent. Now I'm a parent. I know the truth, right? <laughs> uh, I don't think my parents ever said that. This is going to hurt me more than it hurts you. But some, some, you know, it's kind of one of those things. When we read Jeremiah 29, 13 out of context, we, we miss what's really going on here. Because when God says this through the prophet to Israel, to Judah, it's on the heels, it's right in the middle of his pronouncement of their captivity and their destruction. That's what, it, that's what the context is. Now, if you go all the way back to chapter 28, chapter 27 of Jeremiah says that during that time, there were a lot of false prophets in Judah. And God had already sent his prophet Jeremiah to tell to tell God's people, you're going into captivity. You're about to be disciplined. Okay? This is what's going to happen. This is this this is this is not a warning. You know sometimes we do that as parents, if you don't stop that, then I'm going to blah blah blah. It means absolutely nothing to kids, by the way. Not until you actually do something. Warnings don't work. Right? You got to pull the rug out. God's getting ready to pull the rug out from his people, his beloved, whom he chose out of nothing, the least significant nation among all other nations, in captivity for three to four hundred years. He delivers them out of the hands of the Egyptians. He leads them into a land flowing with milk and honey. Walls they didn't put up, cities they didn't build, wells they didn't dig. He just gives it to them. His children, whom he adopted by his grace. And they turned from him. And they went their own way. And they said, no, we have a better idea. We're not going to be disciplined. They stiffened their neck under his reproof. Over and over and over. And so he sends his prophet Jeremiah to come and say, okay, it's time. You're going to go into captivity. And then all these prophets start, start saying, no, no, it's not that bad. It's not that bad. And one of them named Hananiah, we see in chapter 28, comes. And the Bible says, he comes and he says, thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, I have broken the yoke of the king of Babylon. So God says to Jeremiah, you're going to go into captivity. You're going to be under the yoke of Babylon, the king there, Nebuchadnezzar. And this prophet Hananiah comes out in front of all the people and all the priests and says, hold up, I know what you heard, but I have a word from the Lord. And he says that he's breaking the yoke of the king of Babylon. And that in just two years, in two years we'll be back here, we'll be partying like we were, everything's good. No worries. All right? So he delivers that word to the people. Then the Bible says in verse 5, Then the prophet Jeremiah spoke to the prophet Hananiah in the presence of the priests and in the presence of all the people who were standing in the house of the Lord. And the prophet Jeremiah said, Amen. May the Lord do so. May the Lord confirm your words which you have prophesied to bring back the vessels of the Lord's house and all the exiles from Babylon to this place. Yet hear now this word which I am about to speak in your hearing and in the hearing of all the people. The prophets who are before me and before you from the ancient times prophesied against many lands and against great kingdoms of war and of calamity and of pestilence. The prophet who prophesies of peace when the word of the prophet shall come to pass then that prophet will be known as one whom the Lord has truly sent. Then Hananiah the prophet took the yoke from the neck of Jeremiah the prophet and broke it. And Hananiah spoke in the presence of all the people saying, Thus says the Lord, Even so will I break within two full years the yoke of Nebuchadnezzar king of Babylon from the neck of all the nations. Then the prophet Jeremiah went his way. And the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah 
after Hananiah the prophet had broken the yoke from off the neck of the prophet Jeremiah, saying, Go and speak to Hananiah, saying, Thus says the Lord. You have broken the yokes of wood, but you have made instead of them yokes of iron. That's what happens, ladies and gentlemen, when we bypass the discipline of the Lord. When we don't discipline ourselves, when we don't discipline the next generation according to the Lord's word, we do not ease their burden. We make it worse. Verse 14, For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, I have put a yoke of iron on the neck of all these nations, that they may serve Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and they shall serve him. And I have also given him the beasts of the field. Then Jeremiah the prophet said to Hananiah the prophet, Listen now, Hananiah, the Lord has not sent you. You see that? No. No. <laughs> The Lord has not sent you, and you have made this people trust in a lie. Therefore, thus says the Lord, Behold, I am about to remove you from the face of the earth. This year you are going to die, because you have counseled rebellion against the Lord. So Hananiah the prophet died in the same year, in the seventh month. Are we getting the picture? God is not distracted by our false positivism. It doesn't distract him. Now if that comes to you as, as a negative, be encouraged. Because if God is your father and he is your sovereign Lord, he will work these things out in your life so that you will no longer believe in that false positivism. And I don't know what it's going to take in your life. We don't know. But he will bring it about. So here's Israel, his chosen people, Jeremiah, his chosen prophet. And God has a plan to discipline them. And many people come and say, no, it's not going to be that bad. It's not going to be that bad. It's okay. We have a new word from the Lord. And the Lord says, don't lie. My plan is perfect. It's going to be painful. It's going to be hurtful. But you're going to learn. And I have a promise for you. And that's where Jeremiah 29, 11 through 13 come in. But God is not distracted by our false positivism. That's number one. Number two, he will not allow anyone to thwart his purposes. It doesn't matter who the leading evangelical preachers, pastors, theological writers, it doesn't, that none of that stuff matters. When it comes to your salvation, you are secure and sure because of Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior. If you have believed the one true gospel in God's word, it doesn't matter how bad things get in the American church or in this church or in the nation. God will not give you up. He will not give up his church. Jesus said, upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Does that encourage you? Oh, it does me. God's not going to give up on you. He's not going to give up on us. He will not allow anyone to thwart his purposes. He will discipline us for his glory and for our good. Number three, he takes full responsibility for disciplining his chosen people. Look at chapter 29. There was a letter sent explaining God's purposes and plan. Verse 3 says, By the hand of Elasa, the son of Shaphan, and Gemariah, the son of Hilkiah, whom Zedekiah, king of Judah, sent to Babylon, to Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. What is God saying there to his people and to the king of Babylon? He's saying, you didn't take them. I sent them. I sent them into your hand. And he's saying to his people Israel, I am sending you. Make no mistake, God is not passing the, the role of discipline on to someone else. God doesn't discipline people who aren't his. He judges them swiftly. 
His wrath already rests upon the nations. But his people, he will lovingly correct no matter how long it takes because of his sovereign love for us. He takes full responsibility for, for disciplining his chosen people. And then we see in verses 11 through 14 of Jeremiah 29, that famous verse, he's committed to the long game. He plays the long game. He is committed to our future welfare. He will not let you go. And so this, this gives some context, doesn't it, to Jeremiah 29, 11 through 13? Whenever we think about that verse, when we're making that new venture into something big, that new job, new school, whatever it may be, new relationship, well, I have this promise of God. He knows the plans he has for me, plans to prosper me and to give me a future and a hope. But do you ever think about that verse when you're going through the worst time in your life? Because God is, God is saying here later on in this passage, he tells the children of Israel, he says, you're going to be there for 70 years. Not two. That's almost two full generations. Can you imagine telling a young person, telling a 20-something year old, the rest of your life, the rest of your life is going to be in bondage. The rest of your life, you're going to be a slave. The rest of your life, you're going to be in a strange place that's uncomfortable and hard. You're no longer going to be the chief of this tribe. You're no longer going to be the head of this household like you were. You will have no honor and nor will your children what would that do for your attitude? Leaving that place of comfort and heading into that place of difficulty. What would that do for you? When we, re when we see that in context, we understand the love of the Lord, even in the midst of discipline. He's saying, I'm sending you there. You're going to be there for 70 years. But I love you. And I have a plan for you. And my plan is not endless suffering it's not endless pain you may be distressed for a little while as Peter says in his first letter as he encourages Christians he says you've been chosen you've been set apart for a salvation that is reserved in you unfading it will not go away even though now if for a little while you experience various trials like gold going through a refiner's fire you will come out in the end his child for his glory. So brothers and sisters, there are no shortcuts to success in the Christian life. Not for us. God brings about his glory in and through our lives according to his timetable. According to his plan. According to his purposes and for our good. When we don't know what's good in the end, we can't see it, he does. He knows exactly what is good for us. His loving and gracious commitment to our welfare through discipline should ignite within us a desire to discipline ourselves for his glory. To be proactive in disciplining ourselves and one another in making disciples. Disciplining ourselves for the purpose of godliness should not be a drudgery for us. We've been saved by the grace of God. Jesus died on the cross, shed his blood for us. Disciplining ourselves for the purpose of godliness should not be a drudgery. While it's still called today, brothers and sisters, we have the opportunity to cooperate with our Heavenly Father in the work of sanctification. As we get into his word and it washes over us as we pray it, as we meditate on it, as we fast from the other things in life so that we think more about how crucial it is for our sustenance, 
We can actively pursue holiness while at the same time God is sovereignly making us holy. So don't be found sitting on your hands. Your heavenly father has given his only son to save you and to save me. And he is actively working for your good and for his glory. That is his chief end. That's his desire, his purpose for you as you walk with Christ. God is always at work towards that end. So let us get to work for his glory and for our good. Amen.